Hey everybody, this is Nate Smoyer, and you're listening to the Tech Nest Podcast. This is the show where we sit down with the leaders in real estate and technology to find out what they're doing to transform the way we buy, sell, and invest in real estate. If you've got an interest in real estate and technology, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody, we got a great show for you today. We are going to be talking with the founder of a company called Nest Apple. They work out of New York and Connecticut. And really, you know, when it boils down, they're a brokerage. Uh, They're real estate brokerage. They're helping people buy, sell, even rent uh, properties in those areas. And they've got a few programs that work with landlords. But what we're talking about today is a lot really around the commission. How much should agents actually make when they sell or help someone buy a property? Uh, And Nest Apple thinks it should be less. It's not that I don't think that agents are doing a good job, but they think that the value has shifted. And so the compensation should also shift. This is, you know, it's one of those topics is probably unpopular with some people. And that's okay. We can, we can delve into those things, but George Ben Nehalio, I think I got it. Um, it's on the show with me today. Uh, he's the founder and uh, we're talking about uh, all the things in real estate that are unique to New York, uh, why this business model of giving back the commission to the buyer or seller is so important, why the timing is good and what expansion plans he's got for the future. Uh, if you're at all interested in what's happening in the real estate brokerage space and uh, what some of the challengers to incumbents may be working on, uh, uh, stick around. Listen in. Here we go. Well, hey, George. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Nate. Thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate your time. Uh, glad we got a chance here to connect again and excited to, to get into this. Uh, and uh, well, I don't want to, I was almost going to give away the secret of what we're going to talk about, but you, I'll let you do that. So why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself, let everyone know who you are and what you do. Oh, of course. So my name is George Benoliel. Uh, I'm French. Now I have the American citizenship and I've been living in New York for 17 years. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the company called Nest Apple. So it's nestapple.com and we are a licensed real estate brokerage firm. Uh, Right now we operate in New York and Connecticut. And what we do is essentially we give cash back to clients who are looking to buy, sell, rent, and also to landlords willing to rent out their properties. Uh, Most of the clients we represent are actually buyers. For, I would say, out of 10 clients, we represent buyers. And we have a cash back mechanism, giving them two thirds of what the brokers are usually charging in America and on the East Coast. So long story short, uh, uh, we give back to people what the realtors are usually keeping for themselves. That's the the concept. All right. So this is, uh, oh, I, I'm excited to talk about this because um, I, I think there's a handful of companies that are trying to do this. And mm-hmm. so uh, we'll try and go into the details as much as possible. But first we go, before we get too far along there, um, if you had to boil down the number one problem you're solving, what would you, how would you define that problem? I would say the number one problem that people face, especially to move from one apartment to another one, are the closing costs. Uh, in order to buy an apartment, the buyer's closing costs are anywhere between 5 and 7%. In order to, to sell an apartment, it's pretty much the same. And out of those closing costs, the majority are broker fees. Hmm. So uh, you don't want to move from a one bedroom to a two bedroom or from a two bedroom to a three bedroom because what I would call the lead us to do that prohibitive. And what if I were to tell you, you know what, instead of paying 8% Mm -hmm. closing costs to buy, we are going to get you down to two. And instead of paying 6% closing cost to sell, we'll get it down to 1% only. Wow. Maybe you think, well, you scratch your head and say... That's both oh. sides buy and sell side, 1%? Uh, oh. that, is, that is correct. So uh, typically when we represent sellers, 
mm-hmm. uh, 99% of the, the realtors in the city would uh, sell an apartment for 6%, we'll do it for 1%. When we present buyers, mm-hmm. you know that there is this sort of half lie in the US saying that the sellers pay the broker fees, so it doesn't cost anything for the buyers, <laughs> which is not necessarily true because the seller pays both brokers. Mm-hmm. We take the money and we give it back to buyers via cashback. Got it. Uh, if we talk about numbers, let's say tomorrow you move to New York with your wife and you want to buy this $1 million property. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go on your own and you pay that, uh, that $1 million, the seller's agent will get 60K, 60,000, and the, sell, the seller will wow. get 940. If you use, do it with us, it's going to become a cobra, 30 and 30. From my 30, I will give you back 20. So we'll work for 10K. You are going to buy this million dollar property and mm-hmm. leave the closing table with a check from us of $20,000 on which you will pay no taxes. Wow. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's convincing yeah. to me. I mean, obviously then, um, but well, I don't want to state what I believe is obvious. So why New York? Why New York and Connecticut? Of course. So first of all, I live here. Second of all, uh, let's take a step back and take an holistic view. Broker, broker charge anywhere in the world, anywhere between two, two and a quarter, three percent, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, think about France, Germany, Australia, England, Austria, anywhere you want, mm-hmm. the broker fees are two and a half, okay? Give or take, plus or minus half a percent. Mm-hmm. In the US, they are six. In New York, they are six. In Connecticut, they are six. Why are they six? I have all of my theories, but they are six percent. Mm-hmm. So... It did not make sense to me, especially because uh, in New York, everything is very transparent. You can find on Zillow, Trulia, Street Easy, the exact prints of every apartment. You can see what's listed at what price. You can literally stay home, uh, Google the seller, if he has a mortgage, where his neighbor sell, sold their apartment, what's the mm-hmm. average square foot in the building, uh, mm-hmm. if there's any violations. Mm -hmm. Uh, do a mini due diligence on your own. 30 years ago, the brokers were charging 6% in New York. Right now, they still charge 6%. 30 years ago, they were organizing visits via pagers, um, faxes. They had the real expertise. Right now, everything is online. Uh, I'm not saying you don't need a broker. You do. Mm -hmm. But the value added from the broker has diminished and because it has diminished they should get paid less so why new york we identified uh, an opportunity here due to this arbitrage and new york is probably the city in america along with probably san Fran, los angeles and others where the value of the properties is the highest Mm -hmm. so making one percent of every trade in new york creates a a very profitable company and a business opportunity. Got it. Yeah. So, so the, I mean, pricing then really plays into your favor for this sort of model where you can say, Hey, look, we don't need the full commission and we're going to differentiate by, you know, not bloating ourselves on every transaction. And when you're talking, what, what is the average condo price now? One point, like 1.1, exactly. Yeah. 1.1 million. So you're talking to average, average, that is amazing. <laughs> that, that is correct. The work that people do for a 500k apartment and a 5 million apartment is the same. So mm. when I was challenging those brokers, I said, first of all, why do they need to get charged a commission as a percentage? Why not a flat fee? And it's a very taboo to say that. And I've been an investor in real estate before we created that company. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think... The, the idea of the company came after we bought our fourth apartment with my wife. And the third one, I walked in, first open house, the broker had taken five pictures of an apartment, has put them on Street Easy. I come, I bid full ask, and the guy, for a few hours of work, made $60,000. So I scratched my head and I said, it doesn't make sense. 
because it's not the lack of competition. You have 22,000 brokers in New York. Mm -hmm. Why is it this way? Let's, let's just disrupt this market. And we're not saying that the brokers are not doing a, a good job. I'm saying that they should get paid less for the work they do. And from the client's point of view, if we reduce that bid ask, give the money back to buyers, mm -hmm. uh, charge only 1% to sell properties, mm -hmm. uh, we are going to add some fluidity in the market. What's mm -hmm. also interesting, if you're in, a, in front of a computer, the, the general attorney in 2015, Mr. Schlederman, published a letter that none of the brokers want to hear about saying that people, that brokers should give back money to consumers that they charge too much and that cash back is not only legal, it's encouraged. The mm -hmm. uh, Department of Justice, DOG, is encouraging cash back from brokers mm -hmm. to clients. The IRS published a letter saying this is tax free. So there is a, a wave going into this direction. We are still at the beginning. A few other companies do what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, my goal is that the, 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 the piece of the pie is getting bigger. We want to disrupt this industry. We want to bring, we just actually redid our website. So now we have closing cost calculators. We, they can search for these things online. They can organize everything on their own. They can schedule showings. They can place an offer, upload their documents. Mm -hmm. This process needs to be smoother. Mm -hmm. And the broker fees need to get reduced once for all. At least that's our mission. Yeah. So let's uh, let's let's talk about the differentiation because you brought it up. It, it, there are quite a few companies that are offering the either reduced commission rate or they do the cash back. Is there something that Nest Apple is doing that's distinctly different from everyone else? So first of all, I really value each of them. I've met the majority of them. And they are great. There is mm -hmm. four companies doing the same thing uh, that we do in New York. Uh, the market share and the, the value of the commissions in billions is so big that we actually want more people to tap into this market. Uh, the more people do that, the more awareness it will create. Having said that, um, one of the companies that uh, that we compete with, Yorivo, they do. Uh, they don't do rentals when we do it. We love them. Mm -hmm. We send each other's deals sometimes uh, for various reasons. Preview, which is, has been well-funded by private equity, they only mm -hmm. do buys. They don't do sales. Uh, there's one or two more uh, sort of one-man company, mm -hmm. like one broker who is doing that as well, uh, mm -hmm. who are much smaller. But overall, we all have the same vision. I think what we do also, is, which is a differentiating factor, after every deal, we give 10% of our commission of what's left to a charity of the choice of the buyer mm -hmm. um, because we think it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. In terms of difference, differentiating factor, we all have the same access to the listings, technology, photographers, stagers, uh, expertise. There's not that many differentiating factors. We just choose... Uh, our battles. We are in Connecticut. I think we are one of the only one. We do business up there. Mm -hmm. uh, our goal is to go state by state. We want to do Massachusetts. We want to do uh, Pennsylvania. We want to do Florida, Colorado. What we do is mm -hmm. legal in mm -hmm. 40 out of 50 states. Yeah, that's great. And you, you mentioned preview. Um, they were actually a guest on the show back in mm -hmm. October, just last year, episode 61, for those who want to go back and listen to that. Uh, Thomas Kutzman uh, from there, uh, great guy. And you're, you're right, they work on the, the buy side. But you guys are working buy, sell, rent, and with landlords. Can you break down the service offering on the rent and landlords? Because um, that's particularly interesting to me as I work in the rental space. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually not very familiar with this concept in the rental space. Absolutely. Let's say tomorrow you decide to move to New York. Uh, oh in boy. New York, you have two types of apartments. You have... Small and extra small. <laughs> yes, that is correct. <laughs> uh, or very far and very, very far. <laughs> uh, 
So if you move to, to New York, uh, there's apartment with a fee and apartment with a no fee. Okay. The, the, where we really bring the most value, apartment with no fee. Uh, in New York, when you come, you will probably have a dozen real estate brokers offering you services. Uh, they will show you apartments with no fee, with those huge rental companies or the new complexes. And you will, you will feel pretty smart about yourself because you will sign an apartment and pay no broker fees. What you don't know is that the broker who brought you to these apartments is getting paid a, a, a referral fee, which in New York is called OP. It means owner pays. Owner mm. pays to the broker bringing you to those. Okay? Yep. So they will tell you, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm getting paid the referral fee. Right. We get paid that referral fee and we give two thirds back to the person and we mm -hmm. keep one third. It's a very transparent model. Mm -hmm. Let's say you rent a $3,000 one bedroom. We get paid $3,000 from the landlord. We mm -hmm. give you two. The day you sign a listing, we keep 1,000. So you have all of those people in New York looking for rentals, putting right. our name down. Uh, and every time one of them signs a, a listing, we get paid the referral of $1,000. So we are taking the money from the landlord, giving it back to tenants. When there is a fee, and I won't talk much about it because that legislation is about to change, they use us as their buy side broker and we give them back two thirds of the commission as well. Got it, got it. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, there's been some changes in that legislation where, uh, if, I, if I recall correctly, they were putting the, the responsibility or attempting to put the responsibility on the landlords, but it looks like that has been pushed or delayed out, right? Exactly. New York has been the only city in the world where the tenants were paying the broker fees. Mm -hmm. Any other city in the world, it's the landlord who pays brokers. France, uh, Costa Rica, Brazil, Mexico, L London. Right. Landlord pay brokers. In New York, it's tenants. So there has been a, a low uh stating that it's now becoming illegal mm. and the lobby of the real estate has placed that in uh, on hold for about three months so now it's like a legal fight between a judge mm. and the lobby of real estate so we don't know which side is going to go i think that the sense of history and the direction of history is for landlords to pay the broker fees landlords on the capital, they own the properties, they hire brokers, they have the money, they have to pay for the brokers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, let's, let's keep it moving here. Um, I am curious, so, so you've been doing this now uh, for what, two, three years? Exactly, so we started the company in uh, 2017. Uh -huh. uh, my wife signed her first Nestaple contract while she was in labor. Uh, oh burst I've our, heard so stories of this happening, like agents yeah. in the hospital actually signing, you know, uh, uh, dot loop documents or and things like that. That's exactly what happened. We have a picture on our Instagram account. I went to her. She was giving birth to our daughter, Lily, and I asked her, how do you feel? She's like, not well. And I said, can you sign a contract? She said, absolutely. So we did our first deal uh, at uh, NYU Hospital. Okay. All right. All right. There it is. Well, so, you know, you, you've been giving back cash to a lot of buyers and sellers. Have you added up how much you've given back to consumers? Exactly. So we did, uh, we did over, we passed the 100 number of, in terms of number of deals. Okay. Uh, last year we did 36 in, uh, that's a year 2019, mm -hmm. uh, 36 closings for uh, sales. Mm -hmm. uh, we have passed the $1 million mark of how much cash back we give to people. Mm -hmm. And we gave about $10,000 to various charities, which is not bad, honestly. I'm pretty happy. And this year on the business plan, I want to do between 50 and 60 transactions. So what's driving that growth? Uh, I imagine... You know, because you're in New York City, so this is this is one of the most competitive markets to get in front of someone to have the opportunity to pitch. And in, in the name of the game, for those who don't know, in the brokerage world, if you don't get 
the opportunity to to talk to the consumer first, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to get that chance. That is, that is correct. So we 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 just redid our website. We're going to invest in uh, SEO. We we are going to start publishing more and more content on our our site to educate mm -hmm. customers. And it's not not only about cashback. It's what is title insurance? What is mention tax? What is city and state taxes? Yeah. What is the difference between a co-op and a condo? So all of this content drives people. When you add to that social media advertising, Google ads, and also word of mouth. I think in New York now, there has been various articles just telling people that it's legal and that it's, it's, it's an option. Lots of, I, I found this statistic the other day. 86 people, 86% 86 of the people find their house online mm -hmm. themselves and they send it to their broker to organize this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah it, the way it used to work was, you know, it was uh, the, the, the customer would bring the listing, you know, or, or come to the, uh, the office and say, hey, can, can, I, can I see the book of listings? Yes. And then now they, they come to the office if they come into the office or they call the agent or they submit a form and say, hey, I want to go see this listing. And, yeah. and, and invariably, it's almost like, um, you know, because I, I keep in touch with uh, quite a few real estate agents. I'm no longer in the day-to-day -day business. Um, but, you know, they're saying the same thing. I mean, customers, whether, whether true or not, will say they know the market better than the agent. They know exactly which houses in their neighborhood what, which ones just sold and how much and how many days on market and the number of yep. price reductions. Like they're, they're like a hawk watching that every single day and Zillow is just spoon feeding all the real estate, you know, <laughs> real estate drama or, or news that they can. And, and, and they're taking that in and doing a lot of, you know, not necessarily at the professional level, but a lot of analysis of their own area uh, and yeah. anecdotally starting to put that into buckets, you know, of how they see their neighborhood being shaped. So they have uh, everything is online. They can download the analytics. And when you ask about what's driving that growth, more and more people are aware of it. Not only clients, but we're getting referrals from other brokers. We pay them a referral. We are getting referrals from mortgage brokers, bankers. Uh, we are getting referrals from lawyers, inspectors. We want to... I don't mind competing with the people doing cashback. My competitors are the traditional agents threatening people that what we do is not legal. Mm. And my competitors are couples where the husband wants to work with a friend of the wife to keep the wife happy. And mm. I always say, but what is more important, working with a friend of your wife or $90,000 back on your $4 million uh, apartment? So they start thinking uh, and what's driving that growth is also word of mouth uh, it's a little bit cheesy but Nate every time we do a closing mm -hmm. we take a picture of the the person we did a, a closing with mm -hmm. uh, with a big check of how much money we give them back mm -hmm. and I can assure you that if we take a picture of you uh, and we say Nestapol is giving you back Thirty-four thousand dollars. Right. We put, we put you on. We tag you on uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on. Every single of your friend will maybe not call us, but wonder <laughs> what's going on, and at least uh, go on our site <laughs> to see w if it's legit. So. That's oh yeah, they're gonna want to know. Hey, how come you got money when you bought a house? I only wrote a check. That is correct. So, yeah. it's it's cheesy, but it works. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense to me. I, I totally get it. Um, it, it does, does the buyer or seller, like, oh, well, maybe this is more applicable to a buyer. Does the buyer have the opportunity or option to defer the cash back and use that towards their down payment? So, uh, the, so when, you do, when we do co-ops, uh, long story short, the answer is no. But okay. When we do co-ops, they can use it versus their uh, post-closing liquidity. But more importantly, I would say yes and no. Let's look at a $1 million apartment that you're going to finance 80% off. Okay. So you put 20% uh, down and you borrow 80%. So you put 200K down and right. you borrow 800 from the bank. Right. But now 
in New York, some banks even are going to lend you versus 90%. So HSBC, Wells, Bank of America, Chase, they, they allow you to put 10% down and borrow 90 okay? Mm -hmm. So you're mm -hmm. going to buy that same $1 million apartment with 100K. But now what is, it's a 10 to 1 uh, leverage ratio or because you buy a $1 million property by putting 100K down. But if Nestapol is giving you $20,000 back, your leverage from 10 goes to 12.5 because you are going only to put 80,000 down and borrow 900. So your leverage is multiplied. So in essence, it's not really versus a down payment, but mm -hmm. you still get a lot, a lot of money back and uh, it increases your leverage to buy this apartment. Got it, got it. Okay, you, yeah, you I, I get, get it. You get 20% of your down payment back, which is a lot. Wow. Yeah, that's not a small amount of money. I, I'd take that today. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could talk to me a little bit about then uh, the persona that you target, okay? Because uh, I imagine New York, you've got a just a giant range Mm -hmm. of individuals and you can't possibly i mean maybe you tell me i don't know but it feels like you'd have to really di like dial in your persona or avatar of who you really want to go after and who this is going to resonate with most and be and be most mm -hmm. uh meaningful so who is that who's the, that customer for nest apple i would say our ideal customer is the guy who is buying a house for the second time Mm -hmm. And he realized that the first time uh, he had a broker who got paid too much and has <laughs> not done such a good job. He has been to the process once already and yep. he gets it. It's somebody from 35 to 50. Uh, it's his second, uh, it's his second uh, purchase, I would say. Mm -hmm. He calls us and he says, okay, guys, I've seen that as, at, a, at an open house. Mm -hmm. uh, here's my pre-approval here's my attorney here's my proof of funds here's my revenue statement uh, here's the details of my offer I want to put that bid here's are the conditions it's subject to mortgage contingency blah blah, blah. Right. Uh, get it done for me he knows what he wants he doesn't need a shrink he doesn't need to be reinsured he works in finance or law firm or tech uh, we've, let, we've had lots of clients from uh, Google as well. He just gets it. He doesn't need us to drive him all around Connecticut or to take him from open houses to open houses. Yeah. Uh, he has a budget. He doesn't need us to go visit the property with him. He wants his money back. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I can't align with that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if uh if the day comes along where i'm moving to new york city we might have to have a chat um mm -hmm. so with, with, with so much opportunity right in new york and even connecticut though i'm curious uh do you plan on just staying in those areas you know, in the near term you mentioned earlier you got some expansion plans but where does when do you foresee those expansions uh happening so we started Connecticut last year. First of all, we want the goal is to be at 1% market share in all of the areas where we are allowed to do business. Okay, got so, it. So you hit 1%, you're calling that, hey, we've got a firm grip on this market, let's keep moving. That, that is correct. Got it. Uh, obviously, in the five boroughs, just to give you some uh, numbers, you have 20,000 transactions, 1% would be 200. It's about one per business days in mm -hmm. a year. That would be amazing. That's $2 million of, uh, of profits. On top of it, you have uh, Long Island, Hamptons. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a few deals here and there, but not that many. Uh, then you That's have a lot West of time in the car going back and forth. Unfortunately, yes, right now. But if you have one agent over there, uh, right. that's going to make a difference. Westchester, we commute. It's not that far. Uh, we are not at the 1% mark yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have done some deals sporadically, cat skills, upstate New York. Uh, same thing in Connecticut, sporadically. It has not, we only did it when the clients called us, uh, especially people selling their houses here and moving to Connecticut for the public schools. Yeah. But we have not even started the marketing. 
uh, when are we going to grow to other states? I don't think it's a 2020 uh, thing. Probably, I would want to open one more state in 2021, mm -hmm. either Massachusetts, where it's allowed, or Pennsylvania, probably Pennsylvania first, and then Massachusetts in 2022. If you get a 1% market share in those four states uh, and everywhere in the states, then we can go see a fund and actually raise a lot more money than we can do now. Got it. You're just picking all the tough states, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I honestly, like if I were, if I were in your shoes, there's no way. I mean, I also am from Pennsylvania, so I just don't want to deal with like the tax laws and everything. But mm -hmm. Being able to take on these cities, obviously will prepare you for probably easier markets someday. Um, but I suppose at the same time, there's probably some sort of strategic advantage in understanding how to navigate more complicated cities or cities that have a more difficult landscape. Um, there's this and there's also every state where you go, you need to have some reciprocity, get a brokerage license. In mm -hmm. some of the states, you have up to 20,000, I'm sorry, 20 different MLSs in order to, uh, to right. get the mandatory COBRA. So this is a very, uh, very concentrated industry and you there's some administrative paperwork whenever you, you, you grow. What you want to make sure as a company is that you're ready to go into a new state. It's very important to have positive consumer reviews and positive consumer experiences. Mm -hmm. And if you go on Yelp or Google, we have only five-star reviews. The day you start having unhappy clients to buy, to sell, because you don't put the resources in a, in a given market, mm -hmm. then you're going to lose credibility and damage your brand. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, real estate's a referral business, um, especially mm -hmm. on the brokerage buy and sell side. If, you don't, if you're not earning that referral, that's, I mean, you're just going to waste so much time because you're constantly pouring in the top of the funnel and then just out the bottom. And, sure. and, come back. and in New York, New York is a specific market with all of those co-ops. Those co-op boards are really a pain to do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a, so far we've been lucky, we've had a 100% uh, uh, approval for co-op buyers because we've been very diligent at those co-op boards but if on your Yelp or Google reviews there's a few reviews of popping up of people telling uh, Nesta Paul did a very poor job in my co-op board and I got rejected they didn't prepare me then the damage of your brand is done because you cannot re remove those reviews yeah yeah totally understand that um well, let's keep going here. Um, one theme I've noticed with uh, real estate brokerages that are leveraging tech to power their operations, uh, to you know streamline the business flow and really empower agents to really be better at the service uh, to the end consumer rather than constantly chasing new business, um, is also bringing in other services to help pay the bills. And of course, you know you're. You know, when you're subsidizing uh, or, 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 you know, basically reducing how much you're getting on the transaction as your competitive advantage, um, there may be other opportunities in looking to increase profitability. Are you guys looking into or considering expanding into other services, maybe such as like title or mortgages to increase profitability? So that's funny that you say that, but titled, I looked into it, how to disrupt uh, the title insurance business. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to create my own title company and I did a whole business plan. The challenge for that is that the the percentage of a title insurance, it's a, it's a fixed percentage for the states, by the states and by the federal government. So uh, it's, it's very easy to disrupt. Mm -hmm. It's an insurance that I would sell every day. Mm -hmm. uh, for those listeners who don't know what title insurance is, it's an insurer who is insuring the bank and the buyer that the seller is selling the property and that he owns the property that he's selling. Right. There has never been a scam in New York of the last two years of somebody who is selling something that he does not own. So I would sell this property. And for that, they charge zero spot for five, something like that, times the value of the property. I looked into it. It's very hard to disrupt. Uh, most buyers, they pay it. They don't even know what it is. Uh, 
No, but that's because the agent doesn't disclose or even give them a description of what it is. Mm. I mean, just uh, be straight honest with it. And, you know, I, I may, some people might have a t- uh, not like me saying it that way. But yeah. at the end of the day, I mean, you ask a, an agent to explain it and why I need it. And it's really, honestly, it's just this thing that I don't know. You're just told you need it. And that's it. Hmm. So we are not, I, I cannot agree more with you on that. You could disrupt it if the state would not fix a, a fixed percentage for it. But because it's a fixed percentage, I don't see how you can disrupt it. Yeah. Uh, if you look into the details, the large, first of all, the large companies think they are going to disrupt the real estate market with tech are not doing it and are just about, are just, real estate brokerage firms the biggest one who keeps raising money and raising money which is compass is nothing else than a real estate brokerage firm they claim they are tech firm and they are raising money on uh, tech valuations but this is all about real estate and they are in an environment where the fees are decreasing so i'm challenging their valuations all the time and Mm -hmm. we are discussing that with people here i don't see how they are going to sustain those valuations because they are only a real estate a uh, brokerage firm in an environment where fees are decreasing. Uh, to answer your first question, we're not looking to do that, but another market which can be disrupted is uh, appraisals. Most people oh, yeah. spend about uh, $1,000 to appraise yep. a house for a bank. Uh, I can do it for 50 bucks from my living room on Street Easy. Like if, if you look at a New York, property and in a, in a building where there's 600 units and you do an appraisal for 13g and 14g and 12g traded both for a million dollars uh, it doesn't take more than five minutes to write a report saying that the one in the middle should be a million dollar and those appraisals they charge about a thousand it's anywhere between 800 and 900 be when the property is lower than a million Mm-hmm. And when it's above, it could be 1100 up to 1400 So that's a market that can, that can be disrupted. Got it. Yeah, well, I, pre- I appreciate you going into that. Um, I do know uh, the, one, the one area that I'm very, um, I believe also with title that needs to be done is just on the security side. You know, mm-hmm. they're, in, they're so involved in the transaction. Um, and uh, there was a story that came out and I've talked about property quite a few times on the show. I actually just really, I don't know, property really stood out in my mind um, after my conversation with Natalia. She was on episode 55. And um, there was a couple in California recently. I think they lost like $800,000. And okay. it was all because, um, you know, they basically they infiltrated somebody's email to get all the details of the transaction and then they were able to mask and pretend to be somebody part of the transaction between all the yeah. agent, title and mortgage and everyone. And they, then they just give false wire instructions. Yes. And, and, so, then it's, and then it's just done. And there's nothing you can do to get that money. But at that point, it's, I should say nothing. But a lot of times that money goes into an offshore account. It, then by the time they realize it, account's closed, money's gone. Yeah, that's correct. There has been the same, uh, the same cases in New York. Uh, it's it's not really disruption. It's more of fr- it's really totally fraud when a hacker enters into the the, the email of a real estate attorney. He yep. follows the negotiation of the contract and literally on a Friday, just before Labor Day, he would email the buyer saying, "Okay, your contract has been negotiated. Here is the escrow account. Please wire two hundred and twenty thousand dollars." The buyer would wire the money, would not realize because it's a Friday that uh, nobody received it on the other side. And when you come back on Tuesday or Wednesday, you say, have you received it? No, it takes maybe another day to reconcile everything and the money is gone. The, the, the guy who did the fraud is wiring the money to another account and wow. wiring the money is literally like giving an envelope of cash. Wow, wow, wow. I never heard of that one, but that's uh, interesting. Leveraging uh, holidays is like an extra time of buffer. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, um, let's, let's keep moving here. Uh, I want to talk about one other thing before we get to the bottom of the show segments here. Uh, of course we can't get through a whole episode without talking about fundraising. Uh, we spoke about this a little bit prior to our call. 
Um, you know, of course, I look up everybody on Crunchbase. I saw that you had raised some money, but it wasn't necessarily a venture round. Can you can you share some of your philosophy of, of how you go about fundraising um, and uh, how you think you'll proceed moving forward? Uh, understood. So I've been working in finance, and I was lucky enough to to put my money for the company to grow. Uh, if I had raised early money, I think I would have probably spent it too easily. Uh, the fact that you put your own money into a company, you have to learn the program. We, the, the website, we did it ourselves. We learned the cost of acquisition. We first did it on Wix, now on uh, WordPress. We learned all about the uh, Google Analytics. We uh, did all of the PR ourselves. We defined all of the strategy of growth. Uh, we did not take a single dollar of friends and family because all of those were like, oh, I'm going to mention about Nestapol to all of my friends and family and people at uh, Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs, all of this. But my reaction was, I don't want to give out capital for marketing. If I'm good at marketing, I'm going to reach those people no matter what. Uh, we received a few term sheet of people who wanted to put us in uh, incubators for 7 to 10% of the capital. Mm -hmm. uh, our goal is to, we, we are the anti-entrepreneur, meaning everybody would tell us raise money fast to grow as fast as possible and raise as much money as possible. I think we would have burned that money very fast. Mm. We want to grow a little slower, keep 100% of the capital. Maybe it will take us four years when for other people it will take them two, but I'd rather keep 100% control Mm -hmm. I don't want any nasty private equity guys calling me in the middle of the night to discuss my uh, assumptions. Mm -hmm. We have a vision. We, n we know where we're going to go. To go. And it, what has been interesting is that whenever you have to put $1,000 to work and it's your own money, you are really going to see uh, where to invest it. You are not going to fall into the traps of people promising you to be the number one on Google or does a uh, mm -hmm. company pitching you all the time. So uh, we've been more cautious than others. And I've put the money down to start. Now we are profitable, but we are still putting some money to develop ourselves mm -hmm. and, uh, and grow. That's awesome. Yeah, good on you guys uh, for getting there so early and you know, really um, aiming to be a very deliberate uh, company and growth. Um, so very cool. Well, we're, we're going to keep on moving here. We're going to get to uh, my favorite segments of the show. Uh, first one here is called For the Future. For the Future is where I get to ask each guest who comes to the show uh, to give me their best predictions based on the following four questions. George, are you ready to play? I am 100% ready to play. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Question number one, what does Nest Apple look like one year from now? I think one year from now, we will move from two agents to 10 ag agents. Uh, the revenues will triple. The number of deals will be multiplied by five and we'll be at least in one more state. And if we were in the New York Post last year, we will be in the Wall Street Journal in the New York Times. All right, there it is. Question number two, what will prop tech as an industry look like one year from now? So people talk a lot about prop tech and nobody really knows what it exactly is. <laughs> uh, lots of people in traditional sectors are raising a shitload of money uh -huh. saying that they are prop, prop, prop tech firms. Yep, uh, yep. One of them being Compass, which is in my, my opinion, even if they have a very slick website, they are nothing more than a real estate brokerage firms. I know lots of people who went there, they have been poached and very disappointed with the services that they have. Mm. Uh, they do not offer better technology than everybody else. I've tested a few of their assumptions. There's a few other companies which are supposed to be predicting when people are going to buy or are going to sell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. Real estate, it's still all about feelings. It's about expertise. It's about emotions. It's about uh, the relationship that somebody will have with a piece of land or a house. And mm -hmm. no, no broker will know better than you 
what is right for you. So what we tell to all of our people is you should see as many properties as you want. Uh, mm -hmm. The company is trying to call themselves PropTech and offering, uh, uh, I like the idea of a better customer experience, but this is not a, uh, we're not a, a, a bank. And there is no, uh, I think we need to keep the emotions where they are. And the value added here is going to be in the decrease of the fields. Offering mm -hmm. the, same level of, the same level of service and reactivity and ethics for five times cheaper. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some of that I can totally understand uh, when it comes to companies not truly being prop tech. Although I will say this, the prop tech itself is a pretty fluid term. I think it's changing dramatically and it has so much overlap to it from, you know, if it's pure real estate tech or fintech or even insure tech, con tech, mm -hmm. techs, you know, we we'll just call it prop tech. All right. Here, question number three, what's one industry trend you think will continue but you wish would go away? Uh, one industry trend will, which will continue. Title insurance, that will not go away. I wish it could go away. Or I, wish, <laughs> I would say, I, I wish there would be deregulations. I wish that cashback was legal in 40 states. There will always be, uh, listen, the real estate, the real estate lobby is very strong. It's a third industry in the US. I've been reading after oil and the food industry and maybe the car industry. Mm -hmm. the, whenever you attack this industry, they are pouring millions into, uh, uh, into fighting against what you're going to do. So what I wish could go away is that very strong lobby. Uh, look at the broker fees. You want to remove the broker fees, they go to Albany and they fight. Uh, title insurance, same thing. Uh, there's a lot of people in this industry. Uh, whenever you do, a, it's a very crowded market. Lots of people are still flocking to this industry because they watch million dollar listing on Bravo and they think things are easy. Uh, I wish that could go away. I wish lots of people <laughs> would not think, okay, that's, I'm going to make some quick money out of that. And as a trend, I wish that could go away to have 10,000 brokers coming to do that job every year and mm -hmm. nine out of them are not renewing their license because they realize that it's much harder than they had anticipated. Yeah. 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 All right. And question number four here, what's one thing you believe will dramatically change or fade away in real estate as a result of tech advances? Uh, I think what, so, so we were seeing some bigger changes first in, uh, deposits uh, in, the, in term, people don't have to put a deposit for rentals they can pay it over months or we're seeing also some uh, guarantors uh, i'm invest i'm investing myself in a company called the guarantors they okay. are guaranteeing people in new york uh, if you need a guarantor you pay them a fee and they are guaranteeing so mm -hmm. we're seeing some dramatic changes in the services in that industry those companies are really revolution meaning if you don't have to put down a deposit if you don't have to give a uh, if you don't have to ask your mom and dad to guarantee stuff i saw another company the other day they are taking some equity if you buy a property they are buying some equity along with you um, i think also in new york there is more and more sort of roommate uh, type of solutions mm -hmm. like literally apartments or buildings renting to two or three or five or 10 roommates at the same time mm -hmm. that will continue and, and grow. So I think my industry, the real estate brokerage firms will, will, will see a continuity in reducing the, the broker fees, but anywhere around what we do, we're seeing some new startups offering new solutions, whether it's with the deposit, the guarantees, the transportation, the payment model models, um, there's nothing dramatic right now, which is cre creating a revolution, but mm -hmm. a lot, a lot of additional services for the landlords and for the tenants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, George, we're going to keep on moving here. There's three more questions. These are what? really more about you. So listeners get to know you better. Uh, number one, what are you reading? 
Uh, I am. I'm always on the road and doing meetings, so I'm less of a reader than listening to podcasts. I'm on oh, podcasts okay. all the time, uh, most of the time in French, as you can see with my broken accent. Uh, lots of times are historical podcasts, biographies. I listen mm -hmm. to podcasts when I sleep. Um, like not necessarily some current events like French politics and all of that, mm -hmm. but I love 17th, 18th, 19th century politics uh, from the French Revolution to the Napoleonian Empire, every single of those wars, every single of those generals. So I wish I could, sp I mean, if I tell you what I'm reading now, I'm going to show it to you now. It's not very sexy. It is. <laughs> It's a WordPress for dummies. <laughs> <laughs> and That's you don't okay. want to go over the WordPress programming for the website. Uh, uh, I stay far away from PHP. I don't do any of that. <laughs> but in reality, I'm spending a lot more time in terms of enjoying my podcast and then reading those ugly books. All right. Sounds good. Uh, question number two here. Who are you learning from? I'm learning from my wife. She helps me be a better person. She's the one who owns 100% of the company. She's, uh, uh, it was my idea, but it was easier to put it under her name. Mm -hmm. um, she's Costa Rican. Now she's applying for the American and French uh, citizenship. Uh, she worked her whole life in uh, non-for-profit. Mm -hmm. She's the one pushing to give the money back to the community and to have a social behavior. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a very tough person and she helps me be a nicer person and to tame things out. She's the one dealing with all of the uh, execution of those deals. Yeah, I yeah. would explode. She's just the sweet one in the top <laughs> All right. Yep. And the last one here, um, question number three, what inspires you? It's interesting. Uh, whenever we, whenever we do one of those deals, the people are in actually in this business, they are so grateful. Um, some of those people we have changed their lives not only because we helped them buy a place, we took them through the whole process, mm -hmm. but when we give them that much money, uh, they. For them, it's like the, the level of gratitude. Some used it to pay for a year of education for their kids. Some went on vacation. Uh, there was a Chinese couple the other day when they bought, they almost cried. And they were so happy that they gave us a tip in a red envelope, like literally $380. So wow. you see in, in this business, sometimes it's tough and you see some of the people who... Mm -hmm who have like the buyer's remorse or the seller's remorse and say, I bought it too expensive. I sold it too cheap. But when you sold an apartment for somebody for 1% or when you buy an apartment to, for somebody and at closing, you give them $54,000, they feel that they did a good deal. And mm -hmm. they literally tell us how they're going to spend the money, why, when, and that's really inspiring. Uh, when you see how happy you make them. We have, a, we have an Instagram account when we report all of those deals and how people spend their money. Uh, it's very inspiring because for some of them, it changed their life. Some could buy with a cashback an apartment that they could not have afforded otherwise. Yeah, I, I totally believe that. And I've, I have experienced that where, you know, you help people close a transaction where, I mean, it just means the world that that... Mm -hmm you know, that was able to happen for them. Um, I've got one that stands out in my head. I, I met the, the sellers. It was a cold call, you know, and uh, they were getting near retirement, but you know, there was a handful of things about their retirement. They were not looking forward to, which was retiring in a house that was next to the highway. And we were able to help them sell that house with more than enough what they needed to then go buy a place that came with an acre of land out in the County so they could actually mm -hmm. retire in the, what they had always actually envisioned, but you know, felt stuck where they were at. So 
Yeah, totally, totally understand that. Yeah. George, this has been awesome. Really appreciate your time. Uh, really fun digging into this. You know, um, you know, the brokerage game is is changing a lot. It's changing fast. There's a lot of uh, challengers to the incumbents. So uh, keep at it. You know, keep pushing, fighting for the consumer. I love it. Uh, before we head out, uh, people who want to get in touch with you or learn more about Nest Apple, where do they go? How do they do that? Nestapple.com. Uh, that's our website. My personal email is info at Nestapple, but I manage the social media, so Facebook, YouTube, mm -hmm. Instagram, Pinterest, anything. And uh, it's also cheesy, but I created 1855 Nest Apple. So if they forget my number, they can call that, uh, that line. All right. Well, there we go. There you have it. Uh, we got George. Oh, man. George, help me with your name again. B ben Oliad ben from ben New York. Ben Leo. <laughs> I'm going to get it. If not, I promise I'll keep working on it. So thank you. I yeah, appreciate it. Um, and uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you. Have a good one, Nate. Have a good All weekend. Right. And thank yep. you, everybody. Bye. You bet. Thanks. Well, that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening to the Tech Nest podcast. Hey, don't forget, you can get on the email list. You never miss an upcoming episode. That's technest.io. That's T-E-C-H-N-E-S-T dot I-O. Get on the email list. Uh, go to the App Store, whether you found us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you found us. Leave us a five-star review and share it with your friends. And if you've got a guest or someone that you'd like to recommend or if you think that you'd be a great guest on the show, hey, send me an email, nate at realteampanda.com. That's nate at realteampanda.com. See you guys later.